You've made it to Module 9 on PCC's 240M class. Congratulations. Let's go ahead and see what Chapter 12 will show us in our final module. We talked about reliability and availability of our Windows Server. We're going to talk about understanding problem-solving strategies. There's some boot problems that we can resolve, troubleshooting network connectivity, and looking at the event viewer. So how do we solve some of these problems that come up on our Windows Server? So you have to have a strategy. It's not necessarily always an action. You have to have a strategy first before you create your action. And the four general strategies are understanding how a server and the network interact. You got to train your users, of course. Solve problems step by step, so don't jump to conclusions. And then track those problems and solutions, because I guarantee you if it happened once, it'll probably happen again. Many servers and network administrators create a diagram of the office. It's a Visio diagram, which is part of the office suite. Uh, there are other uh, network diagram programs out there as well if you don't want to pay for that. So this is an example of a diagram. <clears throat> Excuse me. We always have the uh, network switches and routers sort of in the center because they connect to everything else around it. We have some wireless access points, some work groups. Uh, we've got server farms and the routers routing between all of them. Typically, you don't see a router uh, that's in this situation. You typically see a switch in the center of this that's running a layer three so it can segment into different subnets. But the router can do the same thing. Uh, it just doesn't have as many ports on it. A network diagram should include a lot of different elements, servers, workstations, wireless, cabled, telecom, uh, wireless and cabled links, remote links, and building locations. So don't try to fit all this into one document. As you see a lot of different things here. It's impossible to fit all this in one document and have anybody be able to read it. You want to keep these things as simple as possible, so you might want to have four, five, 10, 15 different ones. So for instance, telecom should be its own document. Um, the servers and workstations may be their own document. Locations should have their own document. Buildings should have their own document. Then you need uh, to solve network problems by getting as much information as possible when something goes wrong. Record the error message at the time it appears or, or when someone reports it to you. Then you want to determine if other people have had the same problem. If it's just one person, then it's not going to have the same impact if it's an entire uh, you know, department. So for instance, if one person calls says they can't get out to the internet, what you do before you panic is you say, hey, can you ask the people on either side of you, can they get out to the internet? And then you can check to see if you can get out to the internet. And then you can determine you know, um, whether this is uh, you know, a big problem or just an individual issue. You want to check uh, the performance monitor data, power interruptions, and take that information to define your issue. Then determine the uh, possible solutions. Now you got to work on how to fix the issue. Consider the best or most likely solutions. Determine how the solution will affect users. You don't want to cause more problems than, you try, than you're trying to solve. So if one person is having a problem accessing an application, you don't want to reboot the entire server and knock everybody off. After your solution is implemented, you want to continue monitoring to see if the problem comes back. So you got to keep a log of all these problems. Uh, I kept a log in my first IT job because I realized I kept running into the same issues. And the next time the problem came up, I was able to fix the problem much more quickly so I was able to get back to other things instead of trying to resolve the same issue over and over. If a simple reboot does not fix the problem, and that would be, of course, on a workstation, not a server, uh, you can boot into safe mode. After you boot into safe mode, you have the opportunity to further troubleshoot the problem. I would only reboot the server if you get the approval of the bosses and the department heads. If that's the case, then you can go ahead and do that. Now, you can access advanced boot options menu. Sometimes you can press the F8 and you can get the options menu. Other times, uh, you'll have to uh, either boot from the DVD or you'll have to do it from MS Config if the server's still running just not running properly, then you'll have to find it from there. Uh, but F8 doesn't always work on all computers, unfortunately. So if you use safe mode, are unable to troubleshoot the problem, uh, then you can use the enable boot logging option so you can create a log that you can later check for problems. And you can also use this to send to Microsoft so they can help you as well. Uh, so you can, uh, in safe mode, you can run various different uh, programs such as check disk to repair files, uh, you can run a system file checker and other things. Now, in Windows Server 2016, you can access the repair options when you boot off of the advanced uh, menu or from a DVD. 
So the uh, advanced repair options will try to repair your problem automatically. And I can tell you from experience, 99 times out of 100, it doesn't work. But for that one time it does, it's worth it. Otherwise, you go into a command prompt and you can run some additional commands that do work. <laughs> so uh, there are other uh, repairs that are out there. When you select troubleshoot, you can select the option system image recovery or, or command prompt. So if you have a, an image that you created earlier, then you should be able to recover from it. Otherwise, you can go from backup. So from a command prompt, you can run a repair. Uh, lots of different repair commands that are out there. Uh, it's going to be a little bit beyond the scope of this class to go into them, but the book does show some of those repair commands. So using safe mode, Windows 2016 installation DVD and other techniques, there's lots of different uh, tips for fixing boot problems and responding to stop message. A stop message just stops, stops you from getting any further and uh, locks up the computer. If the computer is running, the server is running, but it's not necessarily running correctly, you can go into the event viewer. So let's say the network uh, connectivity is intermittent. So you can go to the event viewer and you can see whether or not the network card is spewing out any uh, errors about the network interface card. So several different categories that may show up on the quiz. Logs, applications, and service logs. So Windows logs, application service logs. And then you get into these Microsoft logs which are specific to applications. All right, so here's what that looks like. You see under Windows logs, you see application security, setup, system, and forwarded events. Forwarded events come from other computers. Then you've got applications. These are specific Microsoft logs applications. And then uh, if you go to the um, Microsoft folder here, then you'll, towards the bottom of the, of the uh, screen here, then you'll get into some of the um, operating system ones as well. Windows generates logs for lots of different things, as we mentioned. Uh, log events are displayed in Event Viewer with an icon that indicates the seriousness of the event. So um, you're going to see either a yellow exclamation with a you know, yellow triangle, uh, or you're going to see a red X, or you know, several different things. If you just see a white information only, there's probably nothing wrong. It's just telling you uh, something has happened. Each log displays descriptive information about the event. So once you highlight the event you want to look at, you can double click on it and you can look at uh, the details. And sometimes it even gives you ideas on how to fix it. It gives you an error number, something you can look up on TechNet's uh, site. So uh, there's lots of good information when something does go terribly wrong. And you can do searches on the internet for that. To view the contents of the log, go to the event viewer, go to the detailed information. You also want to look for the PID number. So we talked about the process identification number when we talked about the uh, task manager. And sometimes the event viewer will tell you which PID number is causing the problem. Go to task manager, find the uh, PID that matches up to the executable, and now you know what's causing the issue. So here are the event properties. There's general information and there's details. Details doesn't always give you the details that you want to see. There might be good uh, sometimes for Microsoft to see, but because it gives you like a memory information in the RAM and things like that, stuff that you may not be able to use. There's also a way to filter logs. All the event logs in Event Viewer have a filter. So if you want to just look at errors or critical issues or informational issues or warnings, you can do that. You could also uh, filter by who has, has put out the event. You could say uh, the security or the network interface card or whatever it is. You could look at audits. So this filter can keep you from having to look through thousands of different logs. It filters down to just the one that you need. So uh, logs can be maintained. You, need to, you have to have uh, some maintenance to do with logs and they can be maintained using several methods. So size each log to prevent it up filling too quickly. So if your event logs are coming in so fast that it doesn't give you a long enough history to troubleshoot it, then you want to increase the size of the log by right-clicking on the log, go to Properties, and increase it. Uh, you can overwrite the oldest events when logs full because you don't want the hard drive to completely fill up with log files. You could also archive that log when it's full. So you could just send it off when it gets to be a certain size, send it off to another server that has a ton of storage. And you can clear the log as well. So if it's uh, not, not useful information to you and you want to free up that space, 
you can just flush all the logs out. One area that server and network administrators often troubleshoot is TCP IP connectivity. That is a big one, and it has some pretty good troubleshooting uh, events that go along with it. Windows Server and Workstation operating systems come with tools you can use. So we can use PowerShell, we can use the command prompt window. The difference between the two is PowerShell shows a PS next to the C drive and the command prompt doesn't. So uh, you can use those commands and each one has their own set of commands. Uh, pinging is a real common one. So if you want to ping, say, the internet or ping, say, the gateway or some other computer or server, then that's a good way to see whether or not um, a computer is alive and responding or whether or not you're connected to them. And then we have NetStat. NetStat is a quick way to verify that a workstation or server has established a successful TCP IP connection. So you can do the NetStat-E, um, and that tells you that information, whether or not there's transmission errors. So that can be really useful. So here we have ipconfig. If you type ipconfig from command prompt, um, it gives you what your IP address is, your gateway, your DNS info. Also gives you IPv6 information as well for all the different network cards you have. And uh, here we have the ping command. So we can see that 0 0.22 is responding, and we can see the speed is one millisecond, which is uh, the expected amount if everything's working correctly. Here we have the netstat minus E. There's the received and the sent uh, packets. We can also see if there's any errors. So you can see the second to last one is errors. If there are, then we know that uh, there is a problem with our network connectivity. Some server administrators like using the system configuration tool, msconfig. So msconfig has a lots of different tabs. The general boot services startup and tools tab. The startup tab has now been replaced with the task manager uh, tab that shows you what's the startup. But the rest of them all still work. So if you go to type msconfig from a uh, command prompt or from a run command, you can uh, change the startup. You can go from normal startup to you can do a safe uh, type of a startup as well. Diagnostics, selective startup, that kind of thing. So when you reboot, it will go to one of these other options during startup. Make sure you come back to this spot and undo it. Otherwise, that's the only way it will start. <laughs> Useful for server administrators to be able to remotely access a server in order to solve a problem. So one way we can do that is using remote desktop. We connect uh, to remote desktop directly, or we set up a VPN connection first, and then connect to it, to it uh, using an internal name instead of an external name. Remote desktop used to be called terminal services, uh, but they changed the name uh, back, I believe, in 2008 to 2008 R2 to remote desktop services. And there you have both a single computer uh, license that you can connect to as an administrator, but you can also have a remote desktop set up for application use by the users. So that part would not be used for troubleshooting. The administrator one would. So here is the option to turn on remote desktop. So you click the allow remote desktop connection to this computer. By default, it's set to don't allow. Now the box underneath it is very interesting. So if you leave that box checked, then only computers that are joined to the domain can access this computer. If you uncheck the box, then anybody can connect to it. So as a, uh, an IT, IT consultant, I would always uncheck this box because my computer would never be a member of the domain that I'm connecting to troubleshoot. But um, if I was an employee of the company, then I would check the box so only domain computers could access it. Adds an additional layer of security. You want to configure a strong password for the account that you perform administration. Uh, seven or more characters is the minimum, and uh, really eight is better, but uh, you know, nowadays the thinking is 12. 12 is actually the new minimum that most people want to see. And of course, you want to have upper and lower case. Uh, you want to have at least one symbol in there as well, exclamation point, you know, et cetera. Remote server administration tools enables you to manage multiple servers from one, uh, one location. The RSAT tools are offered through Server Manager. So by default, when you make a computer a domain controller, it automatically installs these RSAT. And if you want to do these RSAT tools from your Windows 10 computer, where you can see Active Directory users and computers and all the other Active Directory tools, then you can install the RSAT tools on your Windows 10 computer by going to a Microsoft website and doing a search for it. And from there, you'll be able to manage Active Directory from your Windows 10 computer. 
So here are the roles you would need to add if you were doing this from a server. So say you've got a server that's not a domain controller, but you want to add these remote administration tools. Then you can go in and check this box. All right, we talked a lot about how to protect your computer, how to repair your computer. Lots of great stuff out there, and there's even more commands out there to help you in case you run into emergency. Well, when you run into an emergency, you're going to be an IT administrator. There's going to be emergencies. You need to get used to that. So you made it through 240M, 288, and 289M are on the horizon for you, uh, hopefully, and uh, where, where I will see you there as well. So congratulations, and look forward to seeing all of your work, and good luck on your careers and your graduation.